All right. Um, praise the Lord and welcome again to our church and the time that we can have together in the Word of God. Um, I do want to take just a quick second because if you've been alive and paying attention at all this week, obviously you're aware of what happened in our country, right, with the Supreme Court ruling and the overturning of the Roe versus Wade thing. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And it is a, it is a, it's a very important decision. It was ridiculous from the time it was passed 50 years ago. And, 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 and there's a lot of interesting conversation that, that could continue on forward in the politics. They're going to do what they're going to do. And, and regardless of where this goes and your interest will decide how much you follow that. But no matter what, okay, can I, can I just say this obviously, um, children will live because of it. And, and that's, that's the most important thing. It really, really is. So let's, let's us be Christian people and always aware of how we can minister to and encourage, especially um, the ladies that are pregnant and considering abortions, to not do that. Um, th there will all, the states, there will be states that will allow abortions, obviously, but, but more people will live than would have lived. So praise the Lord for that. Okay, so welcome back. We're, we're here and we are currently in this last week of what has been a little mini-series, How Close Are We? Uh, we're talking about the time of the end. We're talking about things of prophecy. And if ever there was a time when it seems to be clear that the people that appear to be in charge are not really in charge, um, but that there's some other force controlling things from behind the scenes, well, I'd say that time is now. Uh, certainly evident in our country. Amen. I mean, it's fair to ask the question, who's really running the United States of America? Right? And depending on your view, you know, you can make your guesses. But let me just, let me just give you the, the right answer. The right answer is the devil. And, and that's not just a cool spiritual thing to say. It's actually biblical. Because in Matthew chapter 4 and verses 8 and 9, this is the time Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and the serpent comes to tempt him. And he says this in verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, Jesus. The devil said that. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus didn't say, Hey, wait a minute, those aren't yours to give. That's not how Jesus answered. Because they actually are his to give. The kingdoms of this world. So last week we took a minute and, and, and I mentioned to you why it's not that important that we look at what's going on in the details of the United States of America to find the clues about the end times as far as it concerns prophecy, but rather you need to look to Israel. And we considered last week the comparing of Israel's 13 judges in the Bible with Israel's 13 prime ministers of current day Israel, and I don't know if you were paying attention to the news this week either, but the very next day, last Monday, Israel just announced that they are dissolving their current government because that coalition government has lost the majority in the Knesset, the parliament, and they're going to hold new elections for a new prime minister in September or October. Uh, now, to be fair, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is a leading candidate to to re-up for another term, and if you're counting 13, he's one of the previous ones. So interesting things. You can't beat that Bible. I'm just telling you that Bible's an amazing book. It's a living book. It's not just a regular book, right? It's alive, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4. And we know that all the Bible is written for you. Now, it's not all written to you, but it's all written for you. And that's a very important principle. So, for example, we understand that only Paul's epistles written to the churches and to individual Christians, those are the books of the Bible that are written directly to us. They're not all written for us. So, for example, when you see a verse like Galatians 3 and verse 28, it actually means a lot when it says there's neither Jew nor Greek, 
There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And, and when you're talking about being in Christ in the time of the church, it doesn't matter if you come from a Jewish background or a Gentile background, because in Christ you're a new creature and old things are passed away. When you want to consider prophecy and when you step outside the context of the church age, which you have to do to consider the times of the end, well, then you have to be very careful in the scriptures because you need to realize that as a church age born again Christian, you're actually reading somebody else's mail. You're reading passages of scriptures that weren't written to you. But nevertheless, God preserved them for you, and we have the legitimate right to look at them and to learn some things from them. So two weeks ago when we began this little series, uh, I wanted us to consider where we would look. Where would you look to find the answers concerning how close we are to the very end? In the first week, we talked about that you need to look to the Lord. You need to look to the Word of God. And then last week, again, we talked about looking to Israel, God's particularly chosen nation. Today, I want us to learn about prophecy as we look to the third thing in the list, and that is to look to the nations. That's the title for today's message, to look to the nations. And I would say that it's important that we look at these three areas and emphasize the fact that we look at these three areas in that order, from the most significant, the most sure, most certainly, to the least sure, right? And so if you've bypass the word of God to look at the nations, you're already, you're already making a mistake, okay? So when we do that, we have to pose the question, why the nations? Why are we going to look to the nations? Well, it should be obvious because the second advent establishes kingdoms. That's what it does. Because when we're looking to the end, we're talking about the timing of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom over the kingdoms of this world, right? Jesus Christ is going to set up a literal physical government ruling other physical governments. We often refer to that as the kingdom of heaven. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 says this, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the kingdoms of this world don't necessarily cease to exist. They just come under the rule and the reign of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we look to the nations because just before the end, we know that we should expect to see some significant movement among the Gentile nations to set up what the Bible refers to in several places, but we we categorize it as this one world socialist communist counterfeit kingdom that's that's going to be the forerunner to the real deal right so if we're going to study the nations with respect to prophecy well there's one book in the bible that's written with that specific purpose and that's the book of daniel i mean daniel is an amazing book and it has a lot of great prophetic material. But today we're going to look into two specific chapters in the book of Daniel, which are going to give us critical information concerning God's view of the nations. Okay? So you may want to open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin. And as you're doing that, let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we come before your word now, and we enter into these things that are images and visions and dreams that you have given and yet Your Holy Spirit has given them to us and recorded them and preserved them so we could have them written in front of us to learn some things. I I pray that you would do just that. I pray you'd open our eyes of understanding and help us to see accurately what you intend for us to understand so that we can have a better idea of just how close we are to the very end. And if you'll do that, then I pray as a result that each and every one of us, as we hear the truth, decide, what does that mean to me? And if there's people here who have yet to settle their eternal destiny, that they do that today. And if there's others who have been playing around with you 
and not taking it seriously, that they take care of that today. Because if this isn't intensely practical, then I don't know why we're here. So speak, I pray, Lord Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Uh, The first thing that I want us to look at, point number one in your outline, is God's vision to the Gentile nations. This is going to be Daniel chapter 2. Now, like I mentioned last week, God's plan for the world has always centered around the nation of Israel. But if you know the story at all, you know that Israel rebelled and in 606 B.C., God sent them into captivity to Babylon. And that's where Daniel is. Daniel is in Babylon in captivity. And while he's in captivity, God gives to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon... A dream. He gives him a vision. And Nebuchadnezzar wakes up and he had this dream and it was crazy and he couldn't quite remember. I'm a lot like Nebuchadnezzar. I have crazy dreams and I wake up and my wife will say, what was it? And I'll be like, I don't know, but it was crazy. (laughs) Nebuchadnezzar had one of those and he calls his wise man. He's like, you guys need to tell me what my dream was and then you need to tell me what it's all about. And they're like, nobody can tell you what it was and what it's about. You tell us what it was and we'll tell you what it's about. And he's like, no, kill them all. Well, eventually, the wise men couldn't interpret it. Only God could. And we're going to pick up the story in chapter 2 and verse number 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, show unto the king. But there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be, in the latter days. That's your context. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. So God had a message for the Gentile king that was currently ruling over God's people, Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar was so great and so powerful and so full of himself that as it appears in this text right here, he was lying in bed one night and thinking, I am awesome. I wonder what's going to happen next. And so God told him. God showed him what was going to happen next. And this message was given to Nebuchadnezzar, which was also to address, as it says, the sin of his heart. And the message generally, if I just want to generalize it for you, because I think the general understanding of this message is very important, so I put this in your notes, Gentile reign is temporary. Gentile reign is temporary. Regardless of how great your kingdom is, Nebuchadnezzar, or how great your kingdom used to be, United States of America, your reign is temporary. Don't get too high-minded. Others are coming, and you're going to get defeated one day too. We'll see that in just a second. This applied to Nebuchadnezzar. It applies to every Gentile power that's ever existed since Nebuchadnezzar, including us. But I want you to understand that this was a message for Daniel and for Israel as well. Because Daniel was to understand that while Israel was currently in captivity because of their sin, they wouldn't be forever. There was a divine plan and there would be several Gentile world powers. But they're not just random They're scripted, and they're sure, and they're found in this this text. So I'm going to pick it up in verse number 31 where we left off and go down to verse 35. As Daniel describes then the image. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. The form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them into pieces. 
Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and God showed Daniel that that was indeed the vision. Now, this vision describes what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. If you were to compare in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24, for example, you'll find that phrase where Jesus uses it. Jerusalem will be trod underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What are the times of the Gentiles? Well, those are the times when Gentile nations are going to rule over Israel and over Jerusalem, right? And that image that Daniel described that Nebuchadnezzar had would have looked something like this. And, And let me just tell you, I had a hard time finding an image on the Internet that didn't also describe horribly wrong descriptions of what all of those things represent, by the way. So just saying. But it's a crazy image, and if you've done children's Bible studies, Bible school, you know, Sunday school stuff, you know, you've probably been through this before. But they represent kingdoms, and we're going to get into that in just a second. But basically, it is an amazing sight. You can imagine if you had this dream, right? But really... What does it mean? What does it really mean? Well, I mean, if we want to understand, we just need to keep reading because God then gives the interpretation. We're going to pick it up where we left off. Verse number 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven hath he given unto thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Remember, friends, that God is the one who sets up and takes down any worldwide power. And he had a worldwide dominion at that time. Uh, Made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, it shall break in pieces and bruise. So if we take a glance back at that image again, and we see the different elements of the metals that are the most valuable at the top, and they get less valuable as they go down, the greatest of the kingdoms was Babylon, And then the the kingdoms that followed, which now we know through the history of time, right, what those kingdoms were. And we'll be looking at those in a second. But these kingdoms that come down the line are each then represented as you see the head is Babylon, the chest will become Media Persia, the belly will represent Greece, and the legs will represent Rome. And then there's a break. And I'll describe that again as we go through a little further. And the last part, the feet and the toes, will represent the kingdom of the Antichrist. And if we pick the narrative back up in verse number 42 in Daniel 2, it says this, And as the toes of the feet were of part iron, part of iron, and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall not cleave one unto another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So another message for King Nebuchadnezzar and the sin of his heart was not just that Gentile reign is temporary, it's also that Gentile world rule leads to the devil. That's where it leads to. If the Gentiles are in charge, it's taking in the wrong direction. Let me just tell you, there are no shortage of wrong conclusions made about these feet and ten toes. Like, do yourself a favor. Study the Bible more and commentaries less. Clearly, Daniel says in verses 42 and 43 that the iron and the clay are mingled seed with men. That means whatever seed is mingled with men is not a man. Do you understand that? And so it's mingled with men. Men come from the clay, the dust of the earth. And iron, through the Bible, is always associated with the Antichrist and devils. 
So what we're going to see at the end in the time of the Antichrist is a repeat of Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of God came down and took daughters of men and had giant offspring of angels and women as it was in the days of Noah. And let me just tell you something. If you just get that one thing down, you're already ahead of most people. But here's what I want you to understand as we consider Daniel 2 to set up what we're going to look at next, and that's this. Only the nations represented in this vision count when considering prophecy in the end. God scripted specifically what he was referring to and to whom he was referring. He wrote specifically about four kingdoms that led ultimately to this time of the Antichrist, which leads to an advent. Those are the four nations. They're not other nations. You can't randomly just pick Finland and, you know, Qatar and whatever. You can't do that. God specifically scripted who they are. Now, that means something, friends. That If you're a Bible believer, it means, now if you don't believe the Bible and you're just whatever Bible, well then, I hope you enjoy the air conditioning, but you're wasting your time here today. <laughs> if you're a Bible believer, that means that Rome is the final world power, period. Now, we know that Rome was the power at the time of Jesus' life about 2,000 years ago. And you know that the Roman Empire fell in about the 4th century A.D. So what about now? Well, isn't it fair to make an argument that God said what he meant and he meant what he said? And therefore, Rome actually never lost power. She still has it. Maybe she just changed the face of her garment and went from being pagan Rome to being papal Rome which has continued to rule over the governments of this world from behind the scenes. I mean, haven't you ever wondered why all the heads of state make their pilgrimage to the Vatican to bow down and kiss the ring of the Pope? I mean, it's something worth considering, isn't it? This setup of this order of nations is actually very important, but just a setup For what I really want us to understand, and this is our second point of study, number two, God's vision to Daniel concerning nations. This is going to be in Daniel chapter 7, so you want to flip forward to Daniel 7. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, you'll see as we begin to read that this vision was given directly to Daniel. This is not something given to Nebuchadnezzar and then God gave Daniel the interpretation. This vision was given directly to Daniel, and that's important because it's not given to a pagan king. It's given to one of God's choicest servants concerning the nations and the end times. So I asked you to flip forward. I think I should too. Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read the first eight verses together. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions upon his head on his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and the four great, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up it, itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it and between the teeth of it, and they said unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there was three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things. Now, there's a seeming endless amount of information to be 
to be sought after and to be studied after. But I want us to kind of get our mind around what this is all about. So there's another little artist rendering of what the four beasts kind of could consider looking like. So Daniel had this vision. And, you know, again, I had to search to find something that didn't immediately describe on the little internet image that I took. Uh, horrible interpretations. So anyways, this is just give you an idea, okay? Uh, the dinosaur thing is kind of crazy at the end, but, you know, it's a weird beast at the end. Okay, so there you go. You got, the, you got kind of a little visual of what Daniel probably saw. Um, and, and so since I mentioned that so many of the images I could have pulled just to give you something to look at, already had written on there what these beasts represent, and they were all wrong. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, I need to take a minute and do for you this Bible study. So letter A in your study sheet is the proper application. you got to understand what he's really talking about. Truly, almost every commentator you read is going to get this wrong, and I promise you, I don't I don't even know how to say that sentence without sounding arrogant. Like, of course I'm right and everybody else is wrong. I don't mean it that way. There's a lot of other right guys. But in the, in the overall view of what is considered evangelical Christianity, we are in the minority. Uh, and in a minute, I think I can prove for you very quickly and very easily why that's the case. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I know I run the risk of, you know, sounding like, well... You know, when you're as great as I am, it's hard to be humble. I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean it to be like that. I just think the answer is very clear, and how people don't get it is shocking to me. Okay, so anyway, what people typically do is they saw four parts to the, the, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, and they see four beasts, and they just immediately line them up. They just line them up. And so they make the lion with the eagle's wings, Babylon, right? And they go, the bear is going to be Media Persia, et cetera, et cetera. And they work their way down, comparing them one by one. And I want to prove for you very quickly and very easily why that cannot possibly be true. And, and to prove it, just flip to verse number 17. Daniel 7, 17 answers it all very, very clearly and very simply. Where it says, these great beasts, which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Please just pay attention to the English words in your English Bible. These are four kings or kingdoms which shall arise. They're future. And the time when Daniel receives this image, verse number one that we already read, he's under Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He's in Babylon. He's in the last days of Babylon, and God shows Daniel the four then kings or kingdoms that shall come. So the first one cannot possibly line up with Babylon. The first one has to line up with, the lion has to line up with Media Persia. That's what it has to be. This is actually very important. They shall arise, Media Persia. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because we all, now we already know. You can fill in the next ones if you want. The next ones as they're going to come, you can fill them in. But, but I just want to show you this before we move on to the next one. Media Persia is associated with a lion. I, just want, I, I found an ancient image that was symbolic of ancient Persia, and this is the ancient image of ancient Persia. It just so happens to be represented by a lion. If you go, ancient Persia is modern-day Iran. And if you go into the history of the nation of Iran, you'll find their flag doesn't currently have a lion on it. And I don't remember the year. I should have wrote it down. But before they changed the flag into the symbol in the center that it is now, just some lines that whatever they represent, used to have a lion that looked a lot like this right in the center of the Iranian flag. The idea is very simple, is that I just want to show you that Life itself, history itself, bears out the fact that when God wanted to compare this lion with a nation, he clearly revealed it in such a way that it would be Media Persia, which then means the next ones are clear. The bear is going to represent Greece, and the leopard is going to represent Rome, and then the the behemoth, which is what I'll refer to that last dinosaur-looking thing with all the horns and all that stuff, well, that's the Antichrist. That's going to be the kingdom of the Antichrist. So unlike the first image that had four kingdoms and then a break, 
and then the toes represent the Antichrist. This image has three because it picks up one lower. And then there's a break, and then there's the Antichrist. And that's exactly how you're going to put it together. Why behemoth or behemoth, depending on some people want to pronounce it, tomato, tomato. I say behemoth because that's, I'm calling it the behemoth because that's literally the Hebrew word for beasts, plural. And this fourth beast is a composite of several beasts all in one. It's referred to as dreadful and terrible. For the rest of us, that just means it's really scary. It had iron teeth. It's exceedingly strong. And it's a lot like where we read in the Bible the word behemoth in Job chapter 40, which, by the way, refers to Satan. In verse 15, where it says, now, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. So you even see these elements associated. He's the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. It's clearly a reference to the devil. It's not a reference to a dinosaur. I hate to ruin it for you kitties out there. But we know that this is the right order simply because we understand the order of the ruling nations of kingdoms after Babylon. They're also referenced later in the book of Daniel and Scripture as well. What am I trying to put out? Well, I want you to understand something. As soon as you find yourself reading some commentary and somebody is comparing the lion with eagle's wings to Babylon, stop reading that. I'm not kidding. And put it aside because that guy does not know what he's talking about. That guy has lost his ability to simply read English and to pay attention to words. So whatever he's got to say to elaborate going down from there is you're off track already. So don't waste your time. This, friends, humbly is the proper application. It just is. That wasn't hard. It really wasn't hard. Okay, so now what I want us to do is use that to set up, let her be in your notes, the prophetic application. And this is where we really want to land. The prophetic application. Yes, of course, the application to Persia and Greece and to Rome was prophetic for Daniel at the time of Daniel in Babylon. But for us today, it's history, right? For us looking back today, it already happened. But it's actually very important that we consider the fact that when God speaks of prophetic things, there's a, there's a thing that he does a lot, and that's that he gives a dual application. A prophetic application frequently can have a dual application, and my attempt is to help you understand exactly how that works and why. Many prophetic passages are. So, for example... Let me give you a simple example. You've been faithful Bible readers for a number of years. You're aware of the fact that when you read about the coming of the Lord in some Old Testament passage, that the coming of the Lord in the Old Testament sees the coming of the Messiah to ultimately rule and reign and set up his kingdom, right? And whether those elements of the, the prophecy of the coming of the Lord applied to his first coming or his second coming, well, it kind of depends, and the prophets had a hard time. Sometimes it's referred to, like by Clarence Larkin, as the mountain peaks of prophecy. He saw the first coming and the second coming almost like two mountain peaks, but he couldn't see the valley in between, which was the church age. And so was it the first coming? Was it the second coming? I mean, maybe it depends, maybe both. I'm not sure. And that's actually accurate as you go back and look. So I thought, well, if I'm going to make such a statement, I should at least give you an example, so a very clear example would be in Isaiah chapter 61, where he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year 
of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. So in these first two verses of Isaiah 61, you'll find if you look in Luke chapter 4 and verse 17, Jesus Christ enters into the synagogue, takes the scroll, takes Isaiah, and begins to read. And Jesus quotes Isaiah 61.1 and the first part of Isaiah 61.2. And he gets to the part where he says, The opening of prison to them that are bound, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he puts away the scripture. He stopped there. And he says to the people, This scripture is now fulfilled right before your very eyes. I'm here to fulfill this very scripture. Well, why didn't Jesus finish reading verse 2? As is quoted in Luke 4, 17. Well, because the day of vengeance of our God is relegated to the second coming, and without going down that rabbit hole too deep, it was all dependent upon whether Israel was going to receive him or not. But since he was already there, the first part was teed up and ready for them right in front of their very eyes. So this prophetic passage has a dual application. Can you see that? It has a dual application. So it could be either, it could be both, it depends on the time of history. You could take the prophecy that before Jesus Christ comes, first there must be the return of Elijah. Remember that one? Now, we find out as we read about John the Baptist, was John the Baptist Elijah? Was John the Baptist not Elijah? You read in one gospel it says that he was, and another one it says that he wasn't, and another one it gives the conditions if he would have been. And that's a fun Bible study for you. But let me just tell you, at the end of the day, was the fulfillment of Elijah's coming in John the Baptist? Yes. Is it yet still relegated with a dual application to Elijah still coming again before the coming of the Lord, Malachi 4? Yes. It's a dual application. You see how prophecy works? And that's actually very important. Because what you have here in Daniel chapter 7 is a dual prophetic application And it has to be that way. Why? Because it's pointing to the advent of the Messiah to set up his kingdom and the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God. And since the advent is divided into a first and second advent, the prophetic application of the nations leading up to that advent are going to be two, a set for the first advent Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and a set leading up to the second advent. And that's what I want us to talk about here now. Before we get into that, reference back to verse number two of this chapter, where Daniel says, notice, I saw in my vision by night, Now, in the Bible, Jesus is called the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness. And he's going to arise at the dawn of the new day, the day of the Lord. John chapter 9 and verse number 5 says that Jesus is the light of the world. As long as I am in the world, he says, I am the light of the world. So that means when Jesus is not currently in the world, like through the church age, It's considered night. So the church age and the tribulation until the Lord physically returns is considered the night, prophetically speaking. So you wouldn't be surprised when you read what Paul writes to the churches in Romans 13, 12, where he says, the night is far spent. The day, the day of the Lord, is at hand. Or in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it starts off saying, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, right? We've been spending three weeks talking about times and seasons. You have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief, not in the daytime, a thief in the night. Because that's what the night is. Therefore, the vision given to Daniel In chapter number 7, it's going to have its fulfillment in the church age and rolling into the tribulation, all of which are considered night. Now, in order for that to be true, 
There has to be a dual application. There has to be. So now let's take another look at these four beasts. Now you've got the lion with eagle's wings that used to be compared to Media Persia. Now, I think, should be compared to England and the United States. The lion with eagle's wings, England and the USA. Now let me just tell you why I think that, because there are some very interesting similarities between Persia and England. Do you know that Persia and England are the only two nations ever to make official declarations, proclamations, to allow Israel to return back to their land? So you have Cyrus of Persia at the very end of 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36, where he makes his declaration rolling into the book of Ezra. He makes his declaration and proclamation that Israel needs to go back to their land, that Jews need to go back to Jerusalem. And in 1917 in England, there was something called the Balfour Declaration where England said after world, or during World War I still that we need to give Israel a land and they need to be able to go back to it. And by the way, England is a kingdom. It's not just a country. They have, they have a king and a queen. They, they have a royal coat of arms. Have you ever noticed the royal coat of arms of England? It's got a lion on it. I mean, there's something to that. The official symbol representing the country is associated with a lion, almost like the Lord wants us to understand something. But the lion in Daniel's vision isn't just a normal lion. It, it has eagle's wings. Some people might call that a griffin. And the symbol of the United States, well, that's the eagle. So I think that this beast represents the English-speaking Western control of the world, which, by the way, has been in power for several hundred years. But now it looks like it's changing. Why? Because Gentile reign is temporary. Daniel chapter 7, verse number 4, The first was like a lion, it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. You see, friends, I think the United States international influence is being stripped away. The lion standing on her feet, kind of like in that royal crest, and it said a man's heart is given unto it. That means it's not lion-hearted anymore. Being lion-hearted means you're brave. She's now become the cowardly lion from the Wizard of Oz because the next beast is now moving, and that's the bear. And the bear used to be Greece, but now the bear has to be Russia. You know the similarities between Greece and Russia? Russia adopted a modified version of the Greek alphabet. It's Cyrillic. Very similar to Greek. You know the official state religion in Russia is a version of the Greek Orthodox Church. It's called the Russian Orthodox Church, but it's virtually the exact same thing. They have the same alphabet. They have the same religion. And Russia's always been symbolized by a bear. In fact, I've got an image here of a political party. That, that literally means united Russia. This is the leading political party. This is Putin's political party. And it's called United Russia. That's, that's their party symbol. It's a bear. Uh, in 1980, in Moscow, some of you are around and remember that, there was the Summer Olympics, and the U.S. even boycotted those Olympics, right, if you remember back then. In the 1980 Moscow Summer Olympics, at the closing ceremonies, there was this balloon that they launched as a part of the closing ceremonies to represent Russian culture. And they tried to make the bear real lovable and all that kind of stuff, but I'm just trying to point out that they're not hiding. That's who they are. Russia's the bear. That's who she is. Verse number 5 back in Daniel, And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. The bear's raised up on one side, well, that's the western side. Nobody ever hears anything about the eastern side of Russia. 
out in the middle of nowhere in Siberia and over by China and towards Alaska. Nobody hears nothing about that. It's all on the western side every time. And she has three ribs in her mouth. She's, she's the bear who's been robbed of her whelps, her children. You realize that ever since the abolishment of the USSR, that Russia has always desired to regain those nations that left. So Belarus has already caved. They're already under Russian control, so that's the first rib. The Ukraine currently is being overtaken, now in progress, probably the second rib, right? By the way, recent articles have come out. Uh, one title of an article that I, that I picked up from The Guardian, it's a, it's a British publication that says, Western leaders say Ukraine war could last for years. NATO leaders are saying the Ukraine war could last for years because a bear moves slowly. They're large, they're powerful, but they move slowly. And I just want to say that you need to keep your eye out for Lithuania. Maybe it will be the third one, I don't know, but there's a chance that Lithuania could be Russia's next target because Lithuania just recently limited Russia's access, free access, to an area of land owned by Russia called Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad is on the Baltic Sea, and you have to pass from Russia through Lithuania to get to it. And the condition of Lithuania's independence was that they would always give Russia free access to Kaliningrad, its only seaport that doesn't, that doesn't freeze year-round that can stay liquid. So they have a big uh, nuclear submarine port in Kaliningrad, and Russia has to be able to access it. And just recently, Lithuania said, oh, no, you're not, you're not traveling through us to get there. And I'm just telling you, Russia's not going to put up with it. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, Lithuania, by the way, is a, a member of NATO and the EU. And an attack on NATO requires a NATO response. And there are currently American troops in Lithuania, so that's just something to keep your eyes out for. I do want you to notice something from the scriptures, though. These beasts, they don't devour the previous one. They don't. Uh, the USA doesn't have to be defeated or destroyed. We just lost our international power and influence. There's been a shift. We're that cowardly lion standing by and watching the bear take over and doing virtually nothing about it. So the leopard, which was Rome, I'm not sure what it is. So I'm just going to offer for you the possibility of what I'm calling an integrated UN, the United Nations. Daniel 7, 6. After this, behold, lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, not an eagle, a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now a leopard has a white belly, it has yellow fur, and it has black spots. It's fully integrated. And this beast represents international racial cooperation with one common goal, which most likely is going to be a land attack on Israel. Now, to be fair, some of these beasts are easier to identify than others. And that's one thing about prophecy, right? They're Prophecy is dark from a distance, but when you get to it, when things start to be fulfilled, you realize, oh, well, that was obvious. That was pretty clear. And plus, Daniel's revelation is referred to later in the book of Daniel as being sealed until the time of the end. So you could make your guesses about who this four-headed beast is because, well, it had four heads. That means it's going to be some type of cooperative effort of Nations with four leading nations. Um, Russia, probably, because armies of the north are going to come down to Israel. China, probably, because armies from the east are going to come in towards Israel. Uh, Germany, possibly, one of the leading nations uh, in the European Union and clearly a historic enemy, right, since World War II of Israel. Uh, Syria, certainly a big player in the end time scenario and dealing with the Antichrist and, and his identity in conjunction with North African nations that would come up from the south. I don't know if that's the case, but that's something to consider. 
Now, I don't know if you remember, there's another image that I want to show to you. Uh, this was placed in front of the United Nations building just last Christmas. If you remember that, November, December of last year. And this was supposedly a gift from one of the southern states in, Me in Mexico and was gifted to us. And then everybody went crazy and saying, it's the end, it's the Antichrist, it's Revelation 13. And everybody went nuts and they were like, oh, we better take that statue down and it's gone. Now, this is not, you know, this is not the fourth beast, right? This is not, uh, but it, it does have interesting elements, right? It has the mouth of a lion and the feet of a bear maybe and, you know, it's got the wings of an eagle and all that sort of thing. And, there, you know, there's, it's actually more like the first beast. It's more like the lion with eagle's wings. And I, I find it interesting because it was set up and removed quickly, kind of like our power national, internationally apparently. And uh, I do think it's interesting because it was set up at a very important location right outside the front doors of the United Nations General Assembly. I'm just telling you all, they're not hiding anymore. They're just not hiding. Uh, the last is the, the behemoth is still the Antichrist. That's not changing because the end is still going to be the end. And if you want to know more about that uh, image in Daniel 7, verses 7 and 8, that last crazy beast, the composite, um, there's several places in Revelation. Let me just read for you Revelation 13. It's almost always referred to together, starting in verse number 1. I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, as the feet were the feet of a bear, and the mouth the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. So this final beast, this final Antichrist kingdom, Remember this, is going to have the mouth of a lion. He's going to be English speaking. He's going to have the feet of a bear. He's going to move like a communist. And, right, he's going to have the body of a leopard. White, yellow, black. He's going to be fully integrated. And he's empowered by Satan himself. I think I put some other references in your notes. We're just going to skip over those. You go ahead and look at those if you want. There's other places to look of descriptions. You want to compare them side by side and do your own study. You want to go to Revelation 12, verses 3 and 9, Revelation 17. I gave you those as well. I want to take a second to draw this thing to a conclusion. How close are we? How close are we? Well, if our interpretation is correct, we just recently moved from the lion to the bear. And the Antichrist is clearly coming during the tribulation. But that four-headed leopard could be during the church age. It could be. If that's all true, how close are we? Well, it could still be a while, but not too long. It could still be a while. It's not necessarily all going to happen before this year's over or the next year begins. The bear moves slowly. It could be another decade. I don't know. It could be less. Of course, we don't know exactly. But if these interpretive methods that we used are accurate, I believe they are. If we can identify at least where we're at in the time of the bear, I believe we can. There's a little bit of things that need to take place still. You might have a little bit of time left. So the real question is, why even study prophecy? Well, it's so that you can answer this question. What are you going to do with the warning God's given you? What are you going to do with the warning? This is not just intellectual stimulus. This should shake you to your very core. This is no joke, y'all. This is God's word. And here's some things to consider. The things that are happening in this global political world, they're set on a course. It's a prophetic course. They're going to happen. You can't stop them. No matter how much you try, no matter how much you don't like it, they're setting up the time of the end. But you know what you can do? You truly can rejoice in knowing that your Bible is true and God is in control. 
You can rejoice in knowing that the creator of all of life has so set it up and is unfolding these pieces right before your very eyes. Never before has the Bible been so true, maybe. At least maybe for you. Something else to consider. We are in all likelihood the generation that never has to die. Praise the Lord. The rapture of the church is very, very near. And can I just remind you from the first week? It's so sure that the testimony of Jesus Christ is on the line. That's how sure it is. So the question for you is, how are you using the time you have left? And you do yourself a disservice if you leave here without considering that. Are you, as a result of understanding these things, going to be more or less holy? 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, specifically says this. Speaking of the time of the end and ultimately being glorified with him, and every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself. This hope, this hope of the end of being glorified and knowing him and being with him and living in glory with him forever, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Knowing that the judgment seat of Christ is looming, knowing that the end could be literally very soon, knowing that we are truly in these last days and proving it. Isn't it time to clean up your act? Isn't it time to make sure that you got any unfinished business, we get that taken care of with the Lord? And among those things, y'all, seriously, we've talked about it over and over. We're going to keep talking about it over and over again. That's personal evangelism. We have got to get the word out to lost people because they don't have much time left either. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. That's kind of like the 1 John 3, right? For some have not the knowledge of God. There's people that don't know God yet. And it's to our shame if they don't. It's to our, sh our shame. We've got to get the word out to them. We've got to do everything that we can, and that's why we plan mission trips, and that's why we make these plans, and if they fall through, they fall through. And if this next team, we're praying that don't fall through. And whether we go or whether we don't go, we're praying and we're working, and that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it to the very end because that's what the Lord wants us to do and that's what would please him. We're done. You can close your Bibles, but we're not done because I want to pray and I just want to pray for you because I want to ask you a question. And you can close your eyes and bow your heads that I ask you this question. Just If you're here today and you're not 100% sure that you know the Lord in salvation and if you were to die today, you'd have your home in heaven immediately. If you're not sure of that, but you want to be sure of that. You want to receive Christ as your Savior. Nobody's going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. And if you would let me know that you're in that category, just raise your hand where you're at. Nobody's going to come to you. Nobody's going to bug you. I just want to pray for you. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I want to be. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Anybody in the house? I'm not seeing it. I'm not trying to drag it out. I just want to give you a chance. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I want to be. Pray for me. All right. As a Christian... What's God said to your heart? What do you need to do for him? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray if anybody here is not saved and they need to get it right, whether they raise their hand or not, that they would just cry out to you and confess their sins before it's too late. You offer them the free gift and you brought them here to this room to hear this message. I pray that they'd respond. But for the brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray you'd take this information and you just burden our hearts with the necessity of living right and taking your truth to the world while we still have a chance. We should run to the finish line. It's time to kick it in to the very end. I love this church, and I pray you'd be pleased with us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.